In this particular section, we're going to talk a little bit about leadership. Um, obviously, in the last last section, we talked about kind of leadership and power and kind of starting to understand how those dynamics start to work together. Well, in order, one of the things that we talked about as well is in order to make um, informed decisions, if you think about support management research uh, regarding leadership, uh, you, you have to understand the leadership process and, and how it relates to this sort of um, social psychological idea of the interactionism paradigm and um, and how individuals relate to the environment, so on and so forth. And so what we want to do is briefly talk about some leadership theories, talk about how to not just examine um, these, th this notion of leadership, but how to really break it down into categories so that we can understand uh, the evolution of leadership, but also where we're going uh, currently in the institution of sport, recreation, and physical activity. The first approach or theory, if you will, is called the trade approach, and it kind of goes back to that whole idea of referent power or it starts with the notion that there are certain quote, sort of quote-unquote inherent characteristics. Um, this kind of goes to the whole idea of personal charisma, um, how people look in a public setting, um, how they display self-confidence in the social environment, the, the understanding of intelligence, that kind of thing. And this is the very earliest form of understanding leadership, and it goes back hundreds, thousands of years. Um, you know, if you kind of think outside of sport for a moment, if you think why you know, why there were a lot of social factors that led into this, but why did so many people sort of gravitate towards Adolf Hitler? Well, it's because he had, he was very charismatic, he was a great public speaker, and he, he you know, displayed that self-confidence, and that manifests itself, obviously, in very negative ways. And what that really did was, um, it really showed this sort of inherent limitations of understand of this trade approach. You know, and that we need to really move past just the individual personal characteristics and how that is influencing this concept of leadership. Now, oddly enough, um, trade approach sort of fell out of favor uh, decades ago um, because it was so limited and it just sort of, you know, predetermined these, these characteristics and attributes of certain people. And so that, therefore, there was only a sort of select few that were able to be leaders. Recently, that's kind of come back a little bit as we started to look at and understand the different models of personality and how they interact and work together. And that these, a lot of, you know, this whole understanding of personality is sort of intuitive to the individual. But um, that being said, trade approach, I mean, some people have natural charisma. Um, but what we want to do is realize that it's not just the inherent traits of the individuals. So obviously, um, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, you, you had a lot of people that were starting to look at the limitations of the trade approach. And they thought, well, it's not necessarily who you are as a person, it's more what you do. And you're like, okay, that, that kind of makes sense. And so um, many, many years ago, there were three major leader type behaviors that were identified. Laissez-faire, um, it just means kind of hands off. Um, you know, you kind of let things go. The democratic um, leader behavior is obviously what all these really sound like is that you know there you're you're getting more of the other subordinates involved the whole idea of democracy everyone has their say and then obviously the autocratic is someone that is very authoritarian um, the decisions tend to be unilateral and come from themselves which means there's no discussion my way the, or the highway kind of thing now what you can see is autocratic is actually fairly efficient I'm not saying it's good I'm not saying it's right but it's efficient uh, dem this whole sort of democratic view, while maybe much more philosophically pleasing, that is, is inherently inefficient because you're taking in so much information. All right. Well, as a way of kind of thinking that, um, we, we have these behaviors. Well, behavior though is it, it's very very broad. So behavior with regards to what? And so now, you know, this particular approach was starting to look at how um, you viewed the task. You know, were you someone that was much more focused on what needed to get done? Or were you f more focused on those individuals that you work with? So one's task orientation and the other's relationship orientation. One is not better or worse than the other. And, and you know, truth be told, you need to have an understanding of both. But that's just another way, it's another layer, if you will, of trying to understand behaviors and how decisions are made. So if you take kind of an amalgamation of those two things and literally start to graphically represent it, the way Blake and Mouton did in the 80s, this is what you come up with. Okay, the concern for results, that's relating to the task orientation, right? 
the concern for people, that's that whole idea of relationship. So if you're low on basically the task and you're low on your concern for people, uh, this is where you be. Okay, and you have different you have your different typologies that are associated with these graphic representations. Okay? So okay, let's say you're really, really concerned about the results. That's all you really care about is things getting done. All right, well, when you do that, if you're not worried about people, then you're graphically right here. And how does that, in terms of efficiency, and kind of, you know, the opposite of that is that you care about the people quite a bit, but you don't really care about whether you're getting things done. Uh, Laissez-faire is going to be kind of in the middle. You know, your, your, your hands are off. You're just kind of letting things go. Obviously, from this basic... Uh, graphical representation, you want to be up here. You want to care about the task and you also want to care about the people. That being said, you know, you tend to find much more country club management and middle of the road management in organizational structure. What do I mean? Middle of the road, country club. It's hard to get people to do things without them feeling negative towards you. And so, you know, this goes back to that interactionism paradigm. This goes back to, you know, the whole idea of mood, emotion, causal attribution, trying to think outside yourself and the good of the organization, all those things that we've spoken about up to this point in the semester. Um, and one of them is, is trying to get people to do things. Well, if you force people to be on time, for example, you're not necessarily, um, you know, because that's something that's really, really concerned with the results but you're not necessarily taking into account individual flexibility. So there's a lot going on. We usually care about what other people think. What you're shooting for, team management. And this, is, this, this idea is going to become very important, um, and we'll kind of build on that in the future as we start talking about some of these things. All right, well, the situational approach um, is kind of is a way it, you know, of trying to talk about and extending the ideas of behavior. You know, behavior is impacted by what? Well, ideally the environment, those external factors, and that's what the situational approach is really, really associated with. Yes, you know, to be a proper, a good and proper leader, you have to have some traits, um, and then you have to understand how those traits are mitigated in the social environment. And, and with, you know, the social environment is going to change based upon your support organization, based upon the task that needs to be completed, uh, based upon, you know, if you work in college athletics, for example. All right, just because you work in intercollegiate athletics doesn't mean you're doing the same thing as everyone else. If you work in an FBS school versus an FCS school, or if you work in an NAIA, NJCAA, all of these things are going to be very, very different. Um, there's a lot of different theories and views out there that sort of can be lumped within this situational approach. Um, that, contingency theory is sort of the most popular one. Uh, it's not the only one. I just, as I'm trying to summarize some of these things, um, I try to pick sort of the, the things that are most applicable, not just to uh, human resource management, uh, but also the sport organizational setting. And so you have to kind of think about from this contingency theory point of view is that the personal style of the leader and then, and this kind of goes back to you know some of the causal attribution stuff, and then your position within the organization is how much control the leader actually has over the situation. All right. So the leader's style and how they interact with other revert, um, refers primarily to this motivational orientation. Are you focused on the tax, the task, or the relationship of the individuals? What's your motivation with regards to leadership? They also identify these major situational variables that more or less are going to influence how much autonomy or control of the situation the leader has. Leader-member relations, task structure, and then obviously the power position. All, right? all of those things sound exactly or, or state exactly what they sound like. When you're talking about leader members, uh, authority structure, um, the authority in figure, or the subordinate. What's that relationship like? The task structure, think about some of the things that we've talked about with the um, goal attainment process or goal perspectives theory. You know, how clearly delineated are the goals, are the ways of producing work, quote unquote, within your sport organization. So all of these things, basically what contingency theory is saying, say that ten times without 
stumbling over your tongue. Um, you have leadership. All right, good and proper leadership is going to be a combination of the nature of the group or task and then the appropriateness of that leader's style. Now, it's con <laughs> the style is contingent upon the nature of task. Okay, in terms of what works best. Sometimes you need to be much more task oriented or democratic or autocratic or whatever. Um, it just really depends on what it is that you're talking about. But all of these things are working together simultaneously. All right, you have the three sub factors, right? We talked about those power, task, and then leader member relations. Those things are going to influence, when I say nature, think about the environment, think about the organizational culture, or just think about that working environment, that climate. Okay, that's kind of what we're talking about here. All right, and then the appropriateness of the leader's style. You're going to emphasize or de-emphasize certain points of view or the way that you uh, explain tasks in a sport organizational setting, depending on who you're talking to. If you're talking to, let's say you're in the Heskett Center and you work with Campus Recreation, if you're talking with another assistant or associate director, your leadership style is going to be different than if you're speaking with student staff. All right, so everything is going to be contingent your form of leadership is going to be contingent on the environment, on the nature of the situation. These are some things here and here that are going to help understand the nature of the situation. Another very popular um, situational approach is called path goal theory to the point that this is actually um, in terms of statistics for those of you that are statistics people and you've kind of taken five, six, seven hundred level classes in statistics, you've probably talked about this as well. It's actually talking about moving along a path <laughs> to a goal. Exactly what it sounds like. You know, there's nothing genius here. Um, basically what it's saying is that, and you're using coaching for example, what's the role of the coach? How does the coach, be it a head coach or position coach or whatever, how is that person involved in this process. According to this particular point of view, that authority figure, the coach, the leader, whichever word you want to use, it sort of cements it in your mind, is actually ancillary or supplemental to the whole process. There's the process. All right. You have what it is you want to achieve. And keep in mind, all this stuff is set in the context of trying to help someone or some subunit achieve a goal. Okay, so you have these characteristics. This is the individual and this is the environment. We're not talking about mud, trees, you know, that kind of stuff. We're, we're talking about the social environment. These two things are working together and actually help to determine the appropriateness of these types of leader behaviors. All right, those then, in conjunction with these things here, lead to this process of achieving goals for the individual or the group. Okay, there's, this, there's a discussion, and you all are able to read these, you know, you're all big boys and girls, in terms of the participant characteristics, and that goes to that individual, almost psychological level. The environmental characteristics relates to the social psychological attributes of the environment. With regards to, you know, impacting paths and goals and the achievement of, of these goals subsequently, you have these four leader behaviors, achievement oriented. All right. This is someone who's expecting. Uh, they have. I mean, obviously, they're going to interact with the the participants in such a way to demonstrate that they have high confidence in them. But they're going to set goals, and they expect these goals to be achieved. Okay. Um, someone who's focused more on the you know the participative aspect. It's it's again more of a, a group environment, more of a group leadership strategy, kind of focused on the whole idea of democracy, getting more input that kind of thing. Uh, supportive is exactly what it sounds like. Caring for those individuals that you're a part of. Now, how does that, and we'll talk about this when we get to transformational and transactional leadership and things like that. You know, there's a line um, and it, based upon the situation and who you are and your you know, personal characteristics and that kind of thing. What does it mean to support those subordinates in your unit? You know, is it people being able to talk about their personal life or whatever? So there's a lot of different things that go into this. And then directive is exactly what it sounds like, providing direction for those individuals. Uh, but when you provide direction, um, it tends to be uh, almost like a micromanager. It tends to be very, very autocratic, unilateral, um, do this, 
do it this way and I'm focused on the end result more so than the relationship that we're building within this environment. Reciprocity. It's obviously the, uh, the hallmark of this particular approach is that the authority figure and the subordinates are going to interact. Their in that interaction is going to be the, the hallmark of goal achievement, goal perspective, and moving the organization forward. And so for the leader to meet their goals, the subordinates have to meet their goals. Those goals, however, and we'll, we'll see this with transformational leadership, um, are associated with organizational goals and motivations. And that's going to be very, very difficult. It sounds easy. and I mean, it's really very easy to understand these different approaches. Transactional, much like it sounds like, um, you're going to try to help the individual growth of the person. And you identify the goals. You help to increase their confidence. And you show that as a personal career, this is how you're going to move forward. There's transactions, if you will, between the people, between the leaders, between the authority figures and the subordinates. Transformational, it's about transcendence, transforming that leadership um, uh, goal attainment process. Okay, the transactional leader is trying to help the individual here. That's not bad, okay? That's a good thing. It's, it's, very, it's much more of an individualistic, um, almost teaching aspect. Okay. The transformational leader, however, is going to take that one step further. Okay. The whole idea of the collectivity, heightened motivation. And what becomes difficult is the realization that for the organization to really maximize benefit, an individual might have to take a back seat. Transformational leadership. Um, was identified in the mid-1990s as the most prominent and efficient and desirable, maybe not efficient, that's a sort of bad use of a word there, but most desirable form of leadership in intercollegiate athletics. Okay? And so for you all in sport management to think about intercollegiate athletics, transformational leadership, this is the new thing. The organization is more important than the individual. There's no I in team, that kind of thing. And so there's four I's, quote unquote, that are associated, kind of hallmarks, if you will, of the transformational leadership style. Idealized influence, motivation, consideration, and then the last one. You know, we, we've talked about all these in some form. This last one is very, very unique. Intellectual stimulation. You're supposed to keep learning. And I've told this story in class before. And I was speaking with an athletic director, and he said when he's interviewing people, the question he always asks him when he kind of goes off the script and kind of gets away from, you know, those people, why do you want to work in college athletics and that kind of thing, he asks them, what are they reading right now? And those people that, you know, try to name drop some book, you know, with regards to leadership or whatever, you know, he said he, you can more or less tell that people are trying to manage that impression. He's like, I don't really care what they're reading. I want to know that they're doing something outside of sport. I want to know that they're bringing and learning from the other aspects of their life and bring that information into what they do in their professional life within this athletic department within sports. Okay, intellectual stimulation does not mean getting everyone in your in your class to go back or in, in your uh, athletic department to go back to school. They don't have to have, you know, they don't have to have extra degrees or anything like that. It's about, it could be something like staying up on the latest software changes from Pat Yolen or Stat Crew or something like that. You know, the idea that you're constantly learning, integrating, reintegrating. When we talk about ways of learning, take that theory and apply it to the latest, you know, Web 2.0 tools or technology and that kind of stuff. Trying to utilize those, you know, intellectual stimulation, a great example. Um, sport organizations were some of the first business-based organizations to capitalize on social media. Okay, that's intellectual stimulation. I hate the phrase, but quote unquote, thinking outside the box. All right, thinking, coming up with new ideas, speaking with new people, hearing new experiences, and then bringing those ideas and experiences into your sport organization. This here is just simply a, I, I, I thought it might be kind of nice, um, just a way of, 
summarizing. You know, we covered a lot of ground there, and I think sometimes it's it can get very daunting. So um, I'm not going to go over the table or anything. It's just kind of a nice little study tool and, and a way of kind of breaking things down.